welcome to a conversation from uh, the Post Trauma Growth Research Group from Liverpool University. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to a number of people uh, on, on the panel. And what we're going to be looking at is uh, the, the researchers that are involved in the Post Trauma group, uh, Growth Group. And they are supervised by Gundy Keenley, Michelle Lowe and Robert Balfour. And to get to get this conversation started, I thought what we'd do is I would come to Hazel. So this is uh, Hazel Lewis. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how this group got started. And I think that goes all the way back to your story of doing um, uh, jury service in terms of where you got the idea for um, post-trauma growth. So if you don't mind, Hazel, would you like to introduce yourself, how the group got started, and of course, where your ideas came from? And of course, then we'll look at the evolution of the group as, as we go through. Hi, yes, I'm um, Hazel Lewis. Um, and my research was looking at the experiences of um, male survivors um, and post-traumatic growth. So I was interested really in how male survivors um, develop their gender roles following child sexual, sexual abuse, given the sort, sort of dominant, dominant and powerful stereotypes that, that men are strong, men are tough, and, and men aren't victims of sexual abuse. So um, really my ideas um, started um, before I, I started the, my clinical training course, and it was, um, I, went, I was on jury service, um, and the case that I was put on was for a, a rape case. And when I got onto the case, um, the victim um, was a gay male, and it became um, really quite evident quite quickly um, when um, people were giving their evidence um, in the courtroom that the victim's gender and sexuality were being used um, by the prosecution as sort of viable reasons, really, of, of why he should be deemed a sort of non credible witness. Um, so things like, you know, why didn't he fight back, things like that. Um, and then it was at the point of um, deliberation when we, we all went in, um, all the jurors went in together to discuss what happened, um, what we thought happened with the case. Um, and some of their opinions were really quite shocking um, in terms of how they interpreted the evidence and, and what they thought had happened, um, you know, ideas that oh men don't do that kind of thing um, he might have enjoyed it if he was gay those type of real um, views that, that I found quite shocking um, and it just sort of made me think that you know male survivors are, seem to be really misrepresented mm. um, you know not just in society but also in, in the court of law as well um, so when I came around to do my clinical training um, I felt that this was um, a good area to, to base my doctoral thesis on and as I knew I wanted to do something with males who've been victimized um, and I contacted um, Gundy um, to discuss my idea and, and hope that she would supervise me um, and Gundy's got a lot of experience in this area you see um, and it was only once I'd started to do the initial scoping and um, looking at the research that was out there um, you know, there, was, there wasn't much research out there, um, that um, all the published information around male survivors was focused on the negative consequences of, of child sexual abuse. Um, there was sort of very little recognition of, um, you know, on the recovery, on the resilience, on sort of positive experience that male survivors um, have. Mm -hmm. um, and as I was looking at the, the research, um, we noticed that the same sort of named author was coming up time and time again. Um, and and that, that was Michelle. So um, we contacted Michelle, um, well, Gundy contacted Michelle um, to see if she wanted to be involved and to talk our ideas through. And then I think Michelle sort of quickly, um, you know, thought of Rob and, and named Rob as someone else who might be um, helpful in, in get involved with the research. So, I actually, at this point, I hadn't heard of post-traumatic growth before. Um, so it was only yeah. after discussing it with Michelle, um, did we sort of develop that research question around um, post-traumatic growth um, and the development of gender role for male survivors. 
based on what you've talked about there, we, we have Gundy came late, which <clears throat> I believe is your primary supervisor, Hazel, in terms of when you were doing your um, doctorate. And Gundy is uh, the academic director. Um, she's also an admissions tutor, a clinical psychologist and psychotherapist and a senior fellow and has lots and lots of experience in and around um, research and obviously this area around um, uh, sexual violence and, and so on and so forth. So if I if I come to you, Gundy, would you like to kind of introduce yourself and, and kind of talk a little bit more about the group and obviously Hazel's uh, research? And then, of course, we'll, we'll go to Michelle, as Hazel kind of pointed out. Thank you, Kath. As you said, I'm the academic director and the admissions tutor for the doctorate in clinical psychology at the University of Liverpool. And I've been there for about 13 years now, I think. But um, by background, I am a clinical psychologist and I've worked as a clinical psychologist for about 35 years. And um, most of my clinical work in the NHS has been in the area of sexual health, HIV, sexual health and sexual trauma. Um, so clinically, I have worked with adult survivors of, of sexual abuse and sexual trauma for, for many years in my NHS roles. And when I then started to work as an academic at the University of Liverpool on the on the clinical psychology doctorate and supervising research, um, that's really uh, kind of, uh, the, I suppose, the key area in which I was offering research supervision based on my clinical expertise and experience in that area. Um, so when uh, Hazel came to me uh, and asked if I'd be prepared to supervise her, um, it, it, obviously her interest matched my interest, it was a good fit and um, as Hazel said when she was um, scoping out the literature um, this name Michelle Lowe kept coming up again and again and I said ah I've come across this name quite a few times I don't think we've ever met but I'll email her and send Michelle one of those you don't know me but emails um, and we arranged uh, to, to, to meet up really which we then did. Hazel um, uh, Hazel and I went to meet up with Michelle and we we sort of thought we would complement each other well with me with the kind of clinical therapeutic background but also research Michelle with her research and academic background and and it was Michelle who mentioned uh, uh, Rob with whom she's obviously worked and researched previously and we felt that our research would really be strengthened by having um, a survivor and expert by experience as part of the group so we'd have that clinical academic expert by experience triad really in terms of a research team um, to, to be able to offer supervision um, and, and that's really how we formed and, and Hazel then became the first of what is now six trainees who um, we have supervised and are supervising on in relation to um, uh, post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as, as, as it's quite clear actually that the, this group is, is formed through academics, um, a, a academic kind of connections, but also there's a real, real kind of personal connection here. Um, so first of all, I think we will head over to Michelle in terms of uh, being the secondary supervisor, but also Michelle is um, a reader and, um, in uh, university and has a wealth of experience, which I don't even want to try and kind of start to, to list or anything here. I think it would be much easier to kind of hand the floor over to Michelle and say, you know, how, how was it for you to become involved in the post-trauma growth group? And what was it like to be able to bring your research to this group in terms of all of the, all of the topics that you've studied in the past as well? Um, I think the group forms um, an accumulation of my research experience over the years. Um, my PhD many years back was in attitudes towards sexual uh, violence, particularly in relation to victims of sexual violence. And looking at the research experimentally, looking at people's attitudes, attributions, um, the blame that people sometimes prescribe towards uh, victims of sexual violence um, really mirrored what, what survivors, what their experiences were. So I, I 
worked in kind of an experimental field, looking at victim blame for several years before I started to branch out into other areas, kind of looking at survivor experiences th themselves mm -hmm. rather than looking at it experimentally. And um, one of the topics that I became interested in and uh, eventually supervised a PhD in, which really kind of brought home to me how important this topic was, was post-traumatic growth. So when um, Gundy and uh, Hazel kind of proposed, uh, Gundy initially, but then when, when I met with Hazel, um, it seemed an obvious road to go down uh, because although the research on male survivor experiences is, is less um, even now than, than the research that's out there on female survivors, what we see predominantly is the, the negative. We yeah. see the trauma, we see the, the disbelief, the blame, the, the negative experiences through criminal justice or through uh, therapeutics. And, and, and there is all that. And, and that is really important to emphasize that those negative attitudes and so on are still out there as Hazel very keenly saw firsthand um, mm. on her jury service. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think there's another story that we need to tell, and I think academics and clinicians really should um, should should broaden their horizons to look at the transformation that sometimes can occur after adversity, stress, and trauma, and and that brings in beautifully the the subject of post traumatic growth. So. It seemed logical to me, to, you know, having this um, opportunity to work with um, the uh, clinical doctorate uh, program at Liverpool. I'm actually a, a reader at the University of Bolton, so um, it was really nice to collaborate with Liverpool. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted really to introduce post-traumatic growth as as an ongoing kind of story, and it's really pleasing to me that from um, Hazel's research, we've been able to, to spread out. And now, like uh, Gundy says, we, we've now got uh, six students who've either graduated or are currently um, in the process of mm -hmm. their um, dissertation. Yeah. Can I jump in and ask uh, um, that kind of uh, metaphor that you've just used there down the, the obvious road? For those that are, uh, so for the, those that are viewing this, could you possibly, Michelle, give a definition of what post-trauma growth actually means because I know that we've been using the term and I'm wondering how many people might actually understand what it is and and yet again might have a stereotype and a myth around what post-trauma growth actually means. I think in its more simplest terms we can define post-traumatic growth as a transformation um, as um, sometimes a sudden realization but quite often a gradual process of personal growth and change after adversity. So it doesn't matter what that trauma is, it can occur after any kind of adverse situation mm -hmm. or series of adverse situations. So it's, it's people who perceive themselves as having grown, having changed in some way. It doesn't, it doesn't take away the trauma. It doesn't belittle the trauma. Quite often the trauma is still there, like the post-traumatic yeah, experience yeah. is still there. I view really post-traumatic growth as, as somewhat of a parallel process, that that transformation is occurring uh, alongside or despite of the trauma, but is triggered by that trauma. Um, and that process can lead to really profound changes in the way that people view their lives, view their relationships, um, view the, the, the very meaning of their life. Sometimes people become more spiritual not in a, yeah. necessarily in a religious sense, but just in that greater appreciation of being alive and wanting to perhaps do something good in the world. That's how I view post-traumatic growth. And I think, I think everybody can recognize that, yeah. that, that kind of situation. 
Yeah, wonderfully, wonderfully put. That was that was beautiful to listen to, actually. So in terms of the, the post trauma growth, obviously, we've talked about Hazel getting in touch with Gundy, getting in touch with Michelle. And then obviously it comes to uh, Rob in terms of his knowledge, his lived experience. Um, so I'm kind of going to jump over to Rob in terms of how how you became involved, because I know that you, you also have a, a passion for post trauma growth. So just to give a little bit of background about who Robert is, he is is the CEO of Survivors West Yorkshire. Um, he is a male surviving, um, uh, male survivor, not male surviving, male survivor of um, child sexual abuse. And you were known to Michelle beforehand. And of course, one of the things that's absolutely obvious to those who are uh, paying attention and looking is Rob is the male of this group, which is really interesting in terms of um, lots of women looking at this particular topic. So. Rob, I'm going to ask you, you know, how did you become involved? But also, what's it like to be currently one of the only males within the group? So for me, um, it, I got an email from Gundy and it was a very nice email. And I get emails from searchers nearly every day of the week, to be honest with you. And by the time Gundy emailed me, I've been an activist doing what I do for nearly 17 years. And I'd been very, I'd always been supportive of research because I always thought it was a useful thing to do. Um, but I must admit, I was getting a bit cynical um, at 17 years because <laughs> a lot of the stuff you get, you never get any response from. You never see the outcome. You never see the end result. And that's not, you know, that's not a criticism of people. It's yeah. kind of people move on and, you know, all of that. So it's kind of, oh, not another one. But then I read post-traumatic growth. And post-traumatic growth is something I've been interested in since I did my undergraduate degree, a rather mature age of nearly 50. And I'd come across the research. And to me, it just seemed self-evident that what it was, was a gateway into mm -hmm. a conversation beyond damage and limitation. Yeah. And that, you know, it was worth engaging because I didn't know what would happen because it wasn't, I didn't sure what was going to happen. And there was also the connection to Liverpool University because I come from Liverpool. So it was kind of nice to kind of get an email from Liverpool. Um, so I said, yeah, okay. And I know Michelle, because me and Michelle have been talking for a long time, nearly over 15 years, I think. And we've actually published a paper jointly in, a, in The Psychologist um, in 2015. So, you know, and that was about male survivors. So, and talking about service development. So I thought, yeah, that's really interesting. And the rest is history, as they say. And I'm sure we'll talk about that. Uh -huh. And just the last week to say, you're asking about male. Yeah. I never think of myself as the male in the room. I actually think of myself as part of the, the collaborative research into post-traumatic growth. And whilst the original focus has been male, and because clearly I have those kind of networks where I can connect in the research and I know I'm male and I'm also a survivor and I've done a lot of reading about degree in psychology. Actually, we're now moving to talk about female survivors as well, because, you know, this is about survivors, really. Yeah. And this kind of growth is not one gender or any variation of any gender. It's about human beings. And, you know, my background, for instance, I think just illustrates that. You know, I'm the logo for Survivors of Yorkshire, the tree, that's the new version, the old version, is much darker, like the one in the picture. But actually, you know, survivors make it on their, in their own in isolated environments, male and female. Yeah. And, you know, post traumatic growth to me is the rainbow. And the more we kind of plant landscapes of hope and meaning and support, tra trauma-informed, whatever you define it as, into those landscapes, the more those trees will, will grow and th flourish, in my view. Again, lovely. I think I actually I'm thinking this is this is beginning to feel really nice and, and warm and fuzzy in terms of the, the conversation. Um, I am going to go back to Gundy just for a moment, uh, Rob, in terms of being asked to come and uh, um, um, go to go to the university. So Gundy, you mentioned earlier that, you know, you, you kind of asked uh, Rob and, and Michelle, you, you've kind of brought somebody in and this this. Um, this phrase of expert by experience. So what, what is it that you wanted to do at Liverpool University? I'm thinking more about um, the conference and people wanting to know how, how do we apply what it is that we're learning? Because, you know, we can have lots and lots of pieces of research, but what do we actually do? And I'm seeing this is a really good kind of pragmatic um, example of that. So, you know, what what is it that you wanted to do and how did it work and how do you see this going forward? with people who are um, experts by experience? Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> it's a really good question. And I think, um, you know, it, I, I guess Rob is part of a, 
movement, perhaps, um, that, um, you know, we, we have started um, on, on the clinical psychology doctorate at Liverpool some years ago, which is about recognising the importance of experts by experience in the training of, well, in the training of all healthcare professionals, but we're training mm -hmm. clinical psychologists, you know, we have experts by profession and experts by experience. We have a, we have a very um, substantial and very involved expert by experience group, which is part of our program called Lexi, Liverpool Experts by Experience. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a range of individuals um, who have um, lived experience of mental health distress, mental health treatment, um, and um, in some cases, um, treatment therapy from clinical psychologists, but who, who are all, I suppose, united by a desire to um, help improve the lives and um, the treatment for people with, with mental health distress. And therefore that is their kind of passion in getting involved in the training of clinical psychologists. So we have experts by mm -hmm. experts involved in selection, in shortlisting, in interviewing, in teaching, in assessment and all, all sorts of things. Where we had have and had less involvement was the um, involvement of experts by experience in research. Um, mm -hmm. and particularly in, in kind of, you know, supervising research. We have one expert by experience who um, uh, was a co-supervisor to a previous trainee prior to Hazel. And we thought this is something that we really want to, to, to foster. And so when Michelle and I started um, supervising Hazel and, and Rob sort of came on board as a, an advisor, really, um, you know, Rob did, way beyond what you could reasonably expect of, a, of, a, of an advisor. I mean, Rob read every draft, every email, commented, you know, the next day, provided feedback, provided all of his time, all of that was inc extremely generous. And yeah, provided far, far more than we could reasonably expect of someone in an advisory position. And therefore, I felt it was actually really important to, to recognise this as by way of, of valuing, formally valuing Rob's contribution and, and expertise. And so I suggested that we um, put him forward for um, an honorary lectureship. So we have honorary teacher contracts um, and that would enable him to become um, a, a research supervisor. Mm -hmm. Um, in the same way that academics are research supervisors. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's, that's where we are. So Rob is an honorary teacher at the University of Liverpool. And um, as I said, you know, we are now on to the sixth trainee. We are jointly supervising in the area of post-traumatic growth. And, and you know, uh, yeah, that's where uh -huh. we are. <laughs> so, so actually, that, 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 that lovely kind of segues into where where we could go next in terms of um, trainees and people coming through and then coming to um, what we might call a ready-made group. Now, I think that that might actually be Chloe's, um, so this is Chloe Wheatman, I think that might be her kind of phrase that she came to a ready-made group in terms of um, researchers. So I know that you were looking at uh, post-trauma growth in male survivors, but you were looking specifically towards fatherhood. So what was what was it like for you to to join this ready made group in terms of the researchers and the, the supervisors and, of course, the the, the phrasing around post trauma growth? Yeah, it was fantastic. I felt very lucky. I think I was relatively new to the world of research, really, having only sort of done a, a, the, an undergrad and a master's before. And mm -hmm. so walking into sort of having three supervisors just felt like wow this is kind of everything <laughs> um but i think for me it was thinking about how can we build upon hazel's research and um how important her findings were yet still how it was only really her research that had seemed to have joined you know the dots between male survivors and post-traumatic growth in that way um and that's when the, the group just really came into its own, I think. It was mm. looking at the literature and seeing, okay, well, where are some of the gaps? And being aware that relationships was a key area that was spoken about for male survivors, um, but very little really about which relationships that was. And then 
I remember having the conversation with the supervisory group about um, parenting for survivors of child mm. sexual abuse. And I think that's when Rob's kind of real world lens was just really fantastic because the research field we know is narrow and we know academia can have a narrow <laughs> focus on things and kind of go down certain rabbit holes. And Rob kind of brings, yeah, but what's important to survivors today in yeah. the real world? Yeah. And I remember talking about um, how damaging the kind of victim to offender, victim to abuser narrative, narrative is for male survivors and how that could actually put male survivors off becoming parents themselves. And I remember thinking, right, you know, that's what this research needs to be about. How can we shine a spotlight on more positive experiences of parenting of fatherhood and that's I think where the idea came for for my research so how does becoming a dad actually enhance post-traumatic growth for male survivors how can we look at this in mm -hmm. a more positive way mm -hmm. so this is this is really really exciting and I think um so that we can have a little bit more of a, a, a conversation. What I will do is um, I'm aware that I'm going to come in just a moment to Alex. But first of all, Alex, I'm going to talk about your research as though you're not here, because what I'm going to do is just kind of quickly go through to make sure that all of these um, these other researchers get hurt. I know I know so the research itself is often kind of uh, limited and you're right, Chloe, with that kind of scope on it. So. Um, within the group and and not everybody is present today um unfortunately because uh it, it can be difficult to get everybody together on a zoom zoom call um alex scott hayes is in her third year and doing um a piece of research now if i'm incorrect on this alex you can correct me but the other students may not um so you're looking at gay and bisexual men and the positive relationships that they might have around their sexuality and gender identity we have a, a Hannah Nicholson, who is in her second year, and she's looking at women's experiences and meaning making around motherhood for child sexual abuse survivors. Rachel Wilson, who's looking at post-traumatic growth around the death of a parent from homicide in a reflective perspective. And uh, Lauren Haythorn Thwaite, looking at post-trauma growth in domestic violence, domestic abuse uh, survivors. So there's a huge amount of research going on. And, you know, as, as the person who's kind of interviewing you all this evening, I, I think this is absolutely fantastic that, that there are so many different variations in terms of those traumas and what they specifically are. So if I come to you, Alex, um, in terms of how you're finding your research and this group, because there is a really high caliber of both supervisors and researchers for you to be joining. So what's what's that like for you? Um, just to amend one thing that you said there, we um, so we started off with the idea of looking at gay and bisexual male survivors. Mm -hmm. And actually over time, that idea evolved um, and it evolved to specifically focus on male bisexuality. Right. Um, so we're just interviewing bisexual survivors, male bisexual survivors. And I suppose part of the reason for that was as um, as everybody's really spoken about so far, um, there is less recognition of male survivorhood, but alongside that and specific to the research that we're working on now um, is the lack of recognition for male bisexuality. So those two experiences running along together and um, mm -hmm. being, I suppose, poorly recognized and often not particularly researched and investigated. And, and that meaning those voices really go, go unheard. Um, and what it's been like to join the group, well, I suppose a bit like Chloe, I was lucky enough to come to a group of ready-made, that phrase again, ready-made supervisory team there and ready to go. Um, and by the time it got to my year, there was quite a few people interested. <laughs> there was quite a few people who were um, interested in engaging with this supervisory group and engaging mm. with this research, which 
which was exciting to see, slightly intimidating at the time when I was trying to go for it, um, but exciting to see how many people were uh, passionate about this area of research. But I think part of that probably was the supervisory team, probably was the on paper, as Gundy said, we have clinical experience, academic experience, and we have ex experience supervision ready to go and relationships that are already developed there as well um, and as somebody who is in a busy doctorate which can get pretty stressful at times that can feel really nice to walk into something that's already there and um, with such such a wealth of experience yeah and, and and it seems that it feels very comfortable there's lots of smiles on your faces and everybody else's so it seems that it's a it's a lovely cohesive group so I'm I'm kind of curious then what what is the group learning as a whole about post trauma growth? So I'm going to kind of open that up to the floor and it'll be a popcorn kind of whoever wants to answer this question rather than me picking on somebody. Shall I say something? Why not? <laughs> I think for me, um, you know, just just that really going back to the basics that post-traumatic growth is possible for, for male survivors um my research found that um the people who i interviewed did experience post-traumatic growth in, in some way i think there's um a lot of assumptions around um people who um suffer child sexual abuse that they're sort of damaged individuals and um it was refreshing to to see that um you know and find within the research that post-traumatic growth is possible for, for for some people um and that might look differently for for some people um you know that how that's experienced might look differently for each of the um for each person but um it's it was just really refreshing just to have that that outcome can I just uh, expand on uh, what Hazel said there? For me, um, understanding post-traumatic growth and understanding that even, even amidst the most terrific of traumas, mm -hmm. that might be a lifelong legacy that you know someone has brought through from their childhood, it can actually give a message of hope to everybody, to everybody yeah. who's experienced adversity, regardless of the age you were at, regardless of anything else about you or, or even about the trauma that you experienced, the fact that transformation and change and growth and that positivity is possible is a message of hope to everybody who listens to survivor stories. And me as a researcher, sometimes academia can feel very dry and very theoretical, but the fact that we can tell people's stories, um, even if it's even if it is in an academic and in a dry context, it feels like I'm doing something worthwhile as a researcher. Yeah. Yeah. But for the wider community, for anybody who has experienced trauma, what I'd like to say is that hope is there and transformation and growth and something positive can come from it. Mm. it. It feels very much, Michelle, when you say that, that there's something about the, the isolation and actually there are others, you know, whom, whom people, I, I'm hearing this message of hope is that the these people who have a trauma are able to look towards others and hear the voice of there is hope, there is a way out. And actually that may involve the growth alongside the healing. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will suddenly jump out and be cured or healed. But it, it kind of feels like that's what this group is really trying to emphasize. Yeah, I, I would say definitely that that is the case that um, in, um, you know, when somebody has experienced trauma, they can feel that they're the only one. They're the only one mm -hmm. who ever experienced that. And um, that negativity can be can be all consuming it can it can be a very lonely road and sometimes other people around them might not really understand how to how to talk to them and you know and and that negativity is is consuming but the fact that 
stories about positivity and about growth, um, I think they do shine a light on, yeah. on the positive aspects that can come from adversity and and that in itself can be very healing it can mm. it can yeah yeah it feels very soothing what you're saying <laughs> and i would just um i mean just to sort of um follow on from what michelle said i yes i think it's an incredibly important message for survivors but i think for me it's also about a, a really important message for um healthcare professionals because mm. You know, speaking about my profession and if I think about my you know 30 odd years of clinical experience when we see clients as clinical psychologists we see people in distress we don't see people yeah. who are you know at the other end and you know feeling much better we see people in distress mm -hmm. and there is therefore a, a you know at least to start with there is a focus on the distress and the pathology and all the difficulties and the damage and all the rest of it yeah. because that is when people present that is when people are referred and I think it's really important for us as, as therapists and as professionals to know that actually you know however awful the trauma is that someone has experienced it is possible it is possible perhaps not for everyone but it is possible for some people not only to kind of you know come out of the other end but actually to have that transformation that Michelle was talking about and to come out the other end having in some way grown and changed and uh, developed in ways that you know perhaps they never thought of before and so something positive has come out of their ability to map to, to to negotiate and to sort of wrestle with that adversity and that trauma and and I think that that hope and that knowledge that is possible is is important first and foremost for survivors but also for healthcare professionals so that they don't get mired in this you know sea of pathology and and, and damage um, so, if, you know, I think for us, it's important as well to think about training and educating, you know, other professionals. Mm. It, it feels it feels like the research is very facilitative in terms of giving those professionals that message that they, they can actually take hope into the, the therapy room or hope into the treatment room or wherever it is these these um, survivors appear because I know that they don't always end up in a therapist's office you know that's one thing to that, that I can certainly agree with you all on um so I'm just wondering then in terms of how you how you see the group moving forward or, or what's the scope for growth interesting metaphor there isn't it what's the growth of the group about post-trauma growth but where, where do you see this going so I can hear immediately from Gundy or perhaps this is me just interpreting it that training and education for clinicians for um, healthcare professionals is really something that could come out of this group but what what do you see the group doing and where does it where does it seem to be heading can I, can I give a comment about where maybe society's heading and I, absolutely and, I, and then where the group might sit within the context of that journey um, so I heard today that you know, Scotland um, had a national framework for ACITS, Adverse Childhood Experiences, some mm. years ago now, nearly a decade. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Wales went there nearly five or six years ago. So uh, my understanding is England is going there. So there is a discussion at the central level to actually mm -hmm. create a framework for England. And it's not published yet, but it's on its way. Yeah. So adversity and trauma is the new conversation. And... You know, it's for everybody. It's not just for one particular discipline. It's everybody. And I think this group, what it's done, one of the reasons that I enjoy doing it and continue to do it is because it is about the story. Survivors sit in that world where, you know, the stories they're told are often the told stories of limitation. They're told that they have to... I worked in the NHS for 10 years. Um, um, and I was probably the only male survivor who was publicly male survivor in the NHS. I don't think as many lasted for 10 years. And um, I was told constantly that we weren't to talk about trauma. And the traumatized, traumatized history of the majority of the people I work with who were 
long and enduring, severe, etc., was that you know they weren't to be talked about, they weren't to be dealt with, and I never did because it wasn't the context in which we worked. But I could see that those conversations, if they were had and the environment was changed in which they lived, then this idea that they were just being maintained, medicated, yeah. and kept safe might change for some. And that, you know, stories I had, people I worked with who were extreme self-harmers, I think in one particular case, and they would harm to the point where they would cut to the bone and pour caustic soda into the wound. And they, they had this flourishing imagination about being an archeologist. And they also kind of wanted, you know, to be heard where they couldn't, mm. they were angry that they would have got the borderline personality disorder logo with bells on because of the way they manipulated mm -hmm. and managed space. And you have to stand up to them and you have to be, you really have to kind of be boundary to work with them. And that was hard work. So I can understand why lots of workers find it really difficult to work with people who are traumatized because they will push the boundaries. It is really hard work. Um, yeah, you know, one evening after she'd been sectioned and I was involved in the section, um, and I'm not a fan of sectioning, I'm sure you can imagine, but in this case, it was necessary for safety for her and for others. Um, she rang up and I thought I was going to get a, a real blasting down the telephone. I was going to get, oh, this is my evening is going to be, I'm going to be feeling projection until I go off shift. And I just heard this quiet voice on the end of the telephone. And she said, I can't say the words. And I know what her history was because I was obviously a party to a file. And I'd been, as and she was, you know, had most severe abuse across her entire childhood from mm. family institutions. And then she was placed into other institutions. And what she meant was she couldn't say sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. She could not acknowledge it. She couldn't, she could, it was inside of her destroying her, but she couldn't say it. And ever since that experience, I've always kind of believed that the story needs to change and that silence needs to mm -hmm. be shattered, really. Not for me, but for people like her, because they're trapped in this world where they can't even say it. You know, they can't even speak it, but they can endure their legacy of it. So for me, when post traumatic growth is talked about, it's about not telling somebody there's a magic land out there. It's about saying that the land you've been, the landscape you've been described to you isn't real. It's kind of distorted. And the real landscape is a possibility landscape where if you're given the right help and the right environments, then who knows what's possible? And that you are a possibility. And I think that's why I'm passionate about post money growth. And, you know, I go back to Maslow and I go back to those humanists who floated around in the 1950s and 40s, who curated a lot mm -hmm. of the conversations that followed on from Freud. And I think, you know, they were talking and people are rediscovering Maslow now and his archives. And he wasn't just talking about how well you did in business and climbed to the top of the corporate ladder. He was talking about all of us. And he was talking about adversity and he was talking about trauma. And he was talking about his own often, because he was often, I think he'd experienced his own trauma as of most of those thinkers. So I think, you know, when we, Gundy says, we, you know, we, we're in the environments and we have to deal with the distress. I've been there, I understand that, really have to understand it. Um, but you know what I think workers are going to have to learn is that actually the 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 hidden distress are all around them and they're called their colleagues often and that you know we're survivors are everywhere and we need to understand that everybody can speak about it and everyone can grow and be possibilities and actually by having role models that sit out their environments in health can in health context police context and all these other contexts are actually acknowledge their own experience of trauma that actually gives permission for other people to grow because they know they can. Yeah. And that's why that's why I'm absolutely passionate about it. That's why I love being in this group, because it gives me a window of possibility of change in that landscape of narrative. And I did my dissertation on, on the social representation theory, which is really about the stories we tell ourselves and how we then shape myths and understandings. Where, is, where Hazel came from in that jury room, those myths and social representations yeah. of what create the landscape we've seen recently with the poor woman who's been abducted and looks like she's been murdered, and people in the press were still putting stories out about what she shouldn't have been walking home and she shouldn't have been doing this. Because we tell these stories about, you know, you should only do what this, this is what's right and that's what's wrong. The, mm -hmm. the person who was wrong was the person who murdered her, by the looks yep. of it. Yep. You know, but those social representations are really powerful and people believe them and they kind of sit inside of us. And the only way you shatter them is by new stories.
So that's why I'm here. And that's why I love this group, because I actually think it's part of that process of change. Wonderfully said, Rob. In terms of, um, I'm just thinking it, it's been a really lovely, compassionate conversation. And I think I'd like to just reiterate what you said at the end there, that wi that, that window of opportunity. I often, and, and this is to go to the trauma literature, you hear of the window of tolerance. Let's let's change it. Let's say what, what you know, what Rob's coming up with, that there's a window of opportunity rather than this window of tolerance, which is limiting. Um, but to, to kind of throw a spanner at you all in this moment, what are you all most grateful for or what do you like most about being part of this group? Because I think, you know, gratitude and compassion is where we've headed to. So I'm, I'm curious to know, giving you time here to think, by the way, <laughs> that what is your what is your favourite part or your your most grateful part of being part of this group? And you can all kind of go whenever you want. Uh, for me, it's about, um, similar to what I said before, about academ academics and academia can sometimes feel very dry. So the fact that I've got the opportunity to work with a group of people who yeah. are like-minded, who um, want to get the message out from people who have stories to tell, who have transformed themselves in some way after adversity um, so I think it's I think I feel I feel blessed and I feel grateful that I'm in a position to be able to do that in some small way. I for me there's something really important about expert by experience and um, mm -hmm. not, just, not just contribution that word I suppose as Gundy was saying earlier in terms of what Rob does in the group like contribution isn't quite enough um, hence the now supervisory title um, but yeah I feel blessed to work in a research capacity um, where expert by experience input is central um, I think for me I came to the doctorate at Liverpool um, as an expert by experience in terms of having my own experience of receiving therapy um, and talked about that in my interview for the doctorate and I really wanted my research to involve um, expert by experience contribution because I think in academia we, ju we just don't have that enough, we don't have enough focus, um, research doesn't focus often enough on the people that it's actually about yeah, um, yeah. and I find Rob's contribution really encouraging, supportive and just a valuable insight um, and I identify as a member of the LGBTQ community. So for me to be able to blend some of my experience, some of Rob's experience with um, the clinical and academic um, support as well, that has to be, I think, my favorite thing of mm -hmm. being part of the group, really. I think just to sort of add on to, to Alex's um, comments there, um, is for me, it was um, having Rob um, as an EBE, um, as a supervisor um, in this um, group was just, I feel like it sort of transformed the research, um, you know, who's just really invaluable really in providing that insight um, into the per um, perspectives of, of male survivors. Um, you know, he sort of consulted in ways which um, you know, we wouldn't have had that insight with, without him on the on the panel um, as a supervisor. Um, just mm. in terms of thinking about how male survivors would experience growth, and um, you know, Rob was saying male survivors might not actually see um, the change as growth. They, they wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. call it growth, and it's just about trying, um, you know, to to. Um, find the right language and find um, the right way to connect with, with male survivors in, in helping them talk about their growth experiences without necessarily using yeah. academic language of, of mm. post-traumatic growth. Um, so just those, those sort of um, insights that are just, you know, really make such a difference to the research. Um, yeah, it, it's just helped me develop as well as, as a clinical psychologist and, um, you know, personally helped me in my career. Um, so yeah, 
Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that, Hazel. And I think it brought an extra layer of thoughtfulness and, and care about everything we were doing. It, it was never just a research project that we had to do as part of our training. It became so much more than that. And I think obviously Rob's presence contributed to that, but I think Michelle and Gundy, of course, also really brought that. And so it was thinking every single step of the way, what will this be like for male survivors? How, how will this be helpful? How will this help to change things? How shall we word things? How shall we write things? They were always at the forefront of the project all the way through, mm -hmm. which unfortunately, we, I don't think we do enough in academia. So I think that was a really helpful mm -hmm. and thing, thing and something that I'm grateful for, definitely. That it, it felt like just more than a research project. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I would echo everything that's been said. And I, I just think I'm in such a lucky position. I feel very privileged that, you know, um, Michelle and, and Rob, we have, because we have been doing this together for a number of years, we've just personally, interpersonally, we, we're really comfortable with each other. And so it just feels lovely to work and collaborate with a couple of colleagues where you feel so comfortable. And then we've got fantastic, bright, keen, trainees who are really you know research is something that if oh, not everybody takes to it but on the d on the on the clinical psychology doctorate it is a compulsory part mm -hmm. and and it's great when when trainees are actually really passionate about what they're doing rather than feeling that they you know have to do it <laughs> and, <laughs> i mean I, I, you know um that the, um, it was mentioned earlier that the, you know that more trainees have wanted to do research in this area and I mean just to say the current um, first year trainees on the doctorate who started last September uh, we're supervising two of them but when um, when I kind of put out some information about um, Rob and uh, Michelle and I supervising post-traumatic growth research in this area and we were kind of a ready-made team and we would be able to supervise a couple of, of projects. Um, we had, I think in the end, we got 12 um, sort of mini proposals from trainees, which is, you know, all, almost half the year. And the main challenge was actually stopping Rob from saying, yes, we'll do more. I was going, no, we cannot. It has to be, we have to two. And it was, sort of, we had to sort of pick the two who in the end we thought would be the best fit for, for us. Um, but, but clearly, uh, you know, for all of the research projects that were put out there for the trainees to think about and, 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 and take up, that was the one by far that, you know, attracted the, the greatest interest. And that's, that is brilliant. I mean, that's a real testament to, I think, the importance of, of, of this area. Mm. So before I come to Bob and ask him what he thinks of his, um, uh, his fans in the group, <laughs> which it kind of feels a little bit like, I wanted to say, you know, just before we do finish, thank you so much for allowing me to, to ask you questions. Um, I feel really honoured to have, have got insight into the group and actually this conversation was absolutely phenomenal this evening. It's, it's been wonderful to listen to and I'm slightly jealous, wish I was part of the group in terms of this feels really lovely. But Rob, over to you for the last, the last words before we, we kind of end the conversation for today. So there's two things I'll say, and they're linked really, because I can have two, because I kind of, I'll be cheeky. So what I really got out of coming to the group was a kind of journey. So my grandmother, and I go on about it, and people laugh, they smile at me because I believe this story. But my grandmother was born in the slums across her own from the clinical psychology department at Liverpool University. And I, you know, Bruce Perry was talking about it um, on um, a video today. He said, you know, he's heard so many um, survivors who've spoken to about those five minutes, that hour of somebody who gave you love or kindness that like, sustained you in the darkness. And my grandmother was that light. So she sustained me through horrendous abuse during my childhood. So that was really, actually, that makes me smile every time I think about it and that she's smiling. But what makes me smile as much is that in six years, I've never felt like the elephant in the room in this process. I've always felt like a human being. 
and that's helped me to complete the next stage of my post-traumatic growth and I wanted to thank everybody for that so you think you're my fans I'm your fans because I've oh. never felt as if I wasn't a human being in your presence and I think you know that's help me to endure continuing not to feel like a human being often in groupings people and that's really hard um, but I know that growth happens not just in the individual but in society because your evidence of that growth for me to sit in that space for nearly six years and never feel like I was the elephant and I wanted to thank you for that because I actually think it's important that you're thanked and that if more people did it, they would see the wonderful smiles that exist between us when we're talking about academic subjects, but yet we're talking about possibilities and hopes for human beings. Wow. What a wonderful ending. What a wonderful ending, uh, but not an ending at all. So thank you very much and um, good night. Thank you very much, Kath, for facilitating that conversation. and. Thank you. Thank you, Kath. Thank you, everybody else. Thank you. Thank you.